This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Maine. The state at the northeastern tip of the United States is an outlier. In the heavily urbanized east coast, it's predominantly rural. It takes up half of New England's land area, yet has one of the smallest populations in the country, much of it wilderness that's far removed from any city or town. Thousands of moose roam wild in the forests that surround beautiful mountains and lakes, while the small fishing villages that line an island-filled coast look like they've barely changed as the decades have gone by. It's home to one of the only national parks in the eastern U.S., borders more Canadian provinces than U.S. states, and has the country's highest proportion of French speakers, most of whom live in remote towns along the border. With a strong maritime tradition, a beautiful landscape, and an interesting culture, Maine is a unique and fascinating state, and the 24th place I'll cover in the U.S. Explained, a 56-part series on every state, territory, and federal district in the country, by order of admission. Hello and welcome to That Is Interesting. I'm your host, Carter. This is the U.S. Explained, episode 24, Maine. According to the Keppen climate classification, Maine sits almost entirely in the warm summer humid continental climate zone, with high humidity, four distinct seasons, warm summers, and very cold snowy winters. It's a similar climate to that found in New Hampshire, Vermont, and upstate New York, all the way through Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota. The few exceptions are parts of a few coastal islands which have oceanic climates more moderate due to the effect of the ocean and the very tip of Mount Katahdin, which at 5,269 feet or 1,606 meters is the highest point in the state and marks the end of the famous Appalachian Trail, which stretches well over 2,000 miles to the southeast to its start at Springer Mountain in Georgia, passing through 14 different states along the way. Katahdin's peak is in a significantly colder subarctic climate zone, a climate zone found in very few parts of the contiguous U.S. Maine receives on average 45.49 inches of precipitation per year, pretty much on par with the part of the country it's in. The state's rainfall is pretty consistent across its regions, and it's the 17th rainiest state in the country. On top of that, it has the second lowest average annual sunlight of any state in the lower 48. Only Washington gets less sun than Maine. And with an average temperature of 43 degrees Fahrenheit, it's the country's fourth coldest state on average, surpassed by only Alaska, North Dakota, and Minnesota. The entire state is located in the eastern time zone, but the neighboring Canadian province of New Brunswick is an hour ahead in Atlantic time. Maine and New Brunswick have a lot of border communities, especially along the St. Johns River in the north, so I'm sure that can be a bit of a hassle. The state has even considered switching to Atlantic time in the past. Though by their location across the International Dateline, Guam and the Northern Marianas see the start of the New Day first, and by a direction of travel, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands are further east, Maine is the easternmost point in the contiguous U.S., so far east that, interestingly, despite being significantly further to the north, it's actually the closest point in the lower 48 to the continent of Africa, as well as, unsurprisingly, to Europe, though each of these points are in different parts of the state. The honor of the contiguous U.S.'s easternmost point goes to Sail Rock, a tiny rock just off the coast of West Quaddy Head, a point guarding the entrance of Passamaquoddy Bay near the town of Lubeck, and the mainland of the country's easternmost point. For a few weeks each year, the West Quaddy Head Lighthouse is the site of the continental U.S.'s first sunrise. For about half the year, that spot is Mars Hill, a hill in northern Maine along the border with New Brunswick, and most famously, for the rest of the year, the first sunrise is at Cadillac Mountain, a peak on Maine's Mount Desert Island in Acadia National Park that, at 1,530 feet or 466 meters, is by far the highest coastal point on the Atlantic coast of the lower 48. Maine is nicknamed the Pine Tree State. It's filled with trees, including many pines, and in fact is the most forested state in the entire country. With over 89% of the entire state covered in trees, no state or territory surpasses it. 
Forest takes up nearly all of the state, the one major exception being the agricultural potato growing part of Aroostook County along the Canadian border. You also hear Maine referred to as vacation land. The state actually ranks pretty low as the country goes in terms of tourism numbers at 44th out of the 50 states in DC, but this stat alone can be pretty misleading. First off, the 15 million people recorded as visiting Maine each year is still huge in comparison to the state's roughly 1 million residents. On top of that, tourism numbers are pretty hard to track in general. The best tourism agencies can usually do is look at hotel and other lodging reservations. But in Maine, this overlooks a major element of local tourism that has a huge impact on the state, second homes. Maine has the highest proportion of vacation homes in the entire country. 19% or nearly a fifth of all houses in the state are second homes, a staggering proportion that only nearby Vermont and New Hampshire come even close to. Some Maine towns even have more second homes than houses occupied by permanent residents. People staying in second homes wouldn't usually make the traditional tourism lists because they aren't checking in the hotels. They might even consider themselves more part-time residents than tourists, though I'm sure many locals might disagree. But as they typically visit more frequently and stay for longer periods of time, they have far greater economic impacts on the state and the towns they stay in than tourists who might just visit for the weekend and have a significant cultural impact on the state. Second homes are often owned by people from major cities like Boston and New York looking for a rural getaway, as the state and its beautiful scenery are fairly close to both cities, with Boston in particular only about an hour and a half away. But a large number as well are owned by people from Portland, Maine's largest city. On top of that, Maine is a popular tourist destination for Canadians as well. Major Canadian cities like Montreal and Quebec City are fairly close to the state, and tourists from Quebec have been vacationing in Maine beaches like Old Orchard Beach, some of the closest beaches for most residents of the province, for generations. Maine's flag shows the state seal on a blue background. It's not a bad seal, it shows a moose and a pine tree flanked by a farmer and a sailor, as well as Maine's name and its motto, Derigo, Latin for I direct. But it's difficult to distinguish from the countless other state seal on blue background state flag designs. The state's former flag, which shows a pine tree and blue star on a beige background, is in my opinion a much better design. It's pretty popular among Mainers, you'll see it on bumper stickers and clothing designs, and people frequently fly it. There's been a push to make it the state flag once again, and after it was approved by the state house, the governor decided to put it up for a referendum, so the people of Maine will vote on whether or not to adopt it in November of 2024. The state's license plate shows a chickadee sitting on a pine branch, a forest, and the words Maine and vacation land. Maine is one of just a few states where the origin of its name is unclear. One theory is that it takes its name from Men, one of the old provinces of France which was supposedly home to property of Henrietta Maria the French-born British Queen. The state has a strong French history, so this would make sense. At the same time, Ferdinando Gorges, who received the colonial charter for what would become the province of Maine, was from a family with a property in the English town of Broadmaine, making it a possible contender for the origin of the state's name. The most common theory, though, is that fishermen off the region's island-dotted coast referred to the land that wasn't an island as the mainland, or simply the Maine. This was once a fairly common synonym for mainland. The mainland colonies of Spain, for example, were often called the Spanish Maine. All these theories, though, are pretty plausible, so it's difficult to tell which is the true origin of the name. If you're from Maine, I'm curious as to what you think. Leave a comment and let me know where you stand on the name origin. As states go, Maine is fairly small. With a land area of 30,843 square miles, or 79,883 square kilometers, Maine ranks 39th out of the 50 states in land area, or in other words, is the 12th smallest state in the country, smaller than Indiana, but larger than South Carolina. It's similar in size to countries like Austria or Czechia. At the same time, compared to many of its neighbors, Maine is actually quite large. Out of the 17 states sitting on the eastern seaboard, not all of which are coastal, Maine is larger than 10 of them, and smaller than 6. In the northeastern US, it's the third largest state. Only New York and Pennsylvania are larger. It's larger too than neighboring New Brunswick, as well as the other maritime provinces of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, all three of which Maine shares some close cultural similarities with. Perhaps most strikingly, the other five states of New England, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, are collectively only slightly larger than Maine. The Pine Tree State alone takes up 49.2% of New England's total land area. 
nearly half of the entire region. In terms of population, Maine is among the smallest in the country as well. It's home to only 1.39 million people, placing it at 42nd out of the 50 states, with fewer people than neighboring New Hampshire, but more than Montana, a similar population to Estonia or Trinidad and Tobago. It's one of a number of states with a smaller population than the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico, which in fact has a population more than twice the size of Maine. There are 34 different urban areas in the country, cities and their suburbs with larger populations than Maine, all the way down to Kansas City, Columbus, and the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. Only eight states, Montana, Rhode Island, Delaware, South Dakota, North Dakota, Alaska, Vermont, and Wyoming are home to fewer people than it. Out of the New England states, only the significantly smaller Vermont has fewer residents. Taking up a small, but not too small, land area, while having a very small population, Maine has one of the lowest population densities in the country as well, with its 44.2 people per square mile, or 17.1 per square kilometer, placing it at 38th out of the 50 states. All the states with a lower population density are huge western and great plain states. The one sitting furthest to the east is Kansas. This gives Maine not only the lowest population density on the east coast, but in the entire eastern half of the country. Not a single state east of the Mississippi, or in fact fully east of the Missouri River, is as sparsely populated as Maine. It's located at the very northeastern tip of the United States, in the region known as New England, when with New Hampshire to its west, it borders only one other state, fewer than any other state in the lower 48, or any other state that has a border with other states at all. The Canadian province of Quebec sits to its northwest, and the province of New Brunswick to its east. The Atlantic Ocean, specifically the Bay of Fundy in the Gulf of Maine, the enormous body of water between Nova Scotia and Cape Cod, sits to its southeast. On top of that, states like Massachusetts and Vermont are close by, and the Canadian province of Nova Scotia is only about 48 miles or 78 kilometers across the Bay of Fundy. The bay has one of the largest high tides in the world. From low tide to high tide, the waters of the bay can rise as high as 50 feet, and at low tide, large swaths of land that were once underwater are opened up. Maine's border with New Hampshire begins at the mouth of the Piscataqua River in the Gulf of Maine, and continues as a water border through the Isles of Shoals, a small offshore archipelago split between the two states, and home to the Shoals Marine Lab. At the mouth of the Piscataqua sits New Hampshire's third largest urban area, Portsmouth, and the main town of Kittery is right across from its city center. Interestingly, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, the oldest naval shipyard in the country, isn't actually in Portsmouth but in Kittery, sitting on an island in the middle of the river that belongs to Maine. Following the Piscataqua and one of its tributaries, the Salmon Falls River, to its headquarters in a small lake called Horn Pond, the area around the border is a relatively populated part of both states with larger New Hampshire towns like Rochester and Dover, not far from border towns in Maine such as Berwick. From Horn Pond, the border follows a straight line roughly north for 120 miles or 193 kilometers to the northern ridges of the Appalachians, where it becomes an international border with the Canadian province of Quebec, weaving northeast along the mountaintops and continuing down in the flat valleys and rolling hills of the other side eventually following a series of diagonal lines to the St. Francis River at the town of Estcourt, across from the Quebec town of Ponagamook. The border follows the river as it weaves to the southeast, and at a point along the St. Francis, it changes from a border with Quebec to a border with New Brunswick. The St. Francis then flows into the St. John River, which the border follows all the way to the town of Hamlin. The area around the river is where most of northern Maine's population lives, mostly in cross-border river towns. The town of Madawaska, for example, sits right across from Edmonston, New Brunswick's sixth largest urban area. From Hamlin, Maine's border with New Brunswick continues south for 77 miles, or 124 kilometers, until it reaches a stream called Monumental Brook, which it follows as it turns into the St. Croix River, following the river's winding course through lakes and forests, and passing through the town of Callis, the Canadian town of St. Stephen, New Brunswick, on the other side. The river widens into Passamaquoddy Bay, emptying into the Bay of Fundy, and there at West Quaddy Head, the U.S.-Canada border, the longest land border on Earth, reaches its eastern end, having stretched nearly 4,000 miles from Point Roberts, Washington in the west. The bay, filled with islands and lined by peninsulas, is home to the towns of Eastport and Lubeck, which sit just across the water from Canada's Campobello Island, 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt's vacation home and a community cut off by land from the rest of Canada. Canadians living there must cross an international border to leave as the only bridge goes to Maine. It's proved a major logistical challenge for locals, and there have even been proposals to sell it to the United States, or even trade it for the similarly isolated Washington town of Point Roberts. Maine is dominated by a rugged landscape. Most all of the state is covered in rolling hills and mountains. Though they're smaller closer to the coast, the state lies beyond the northern edge of the coastal plain that stretches across most of the east coast, and this leaves consistently little flat land. It's the only east coast state where mountains dive right into the ocean something you'd usually have to go to west coast states like California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, or Hawaii to find. The higher peaks of the Appalachians, though, cut northeast from New Hampshire into New Brunswick and Quebec, and are at their highest in the state from Mount Katahdin, the end point of the Appalachian Trail, to the New Hampshire border. Because of this, most of Maine's major rivers originate in this highly elevated northern and west central part of the state, and typically flow north to south. It's home to six major rivers, many of which are quite large. The Saco flows in from the White Mountains of New Hampshire and flows into the Atlantic near Biddeford. Most of western Maine is in the watersheds of the Kennebec and the Androscoggin, which flows into the Kennebec and together into the Atlantic near the town of Bath. Much of the central part of the state is in the watershed of the Penobscot River, which empties into the huge island-filled Penobscot Bay, the largest bay in the state, south of Bangor. In the east, the St. Croix forms much of the border with New Brunswick, but the longest river in the state, though not the longest fully within it, is the St. John. The river begins in the state, and a rare exception flows south to north, forms much of Maine's northern border, then enters New Brunswick and turns south, meeting the Bay of Fundy in the province's capital city of St. John. Across the entirety of the state, you can find lakes both large and small, and most of the landscape is heavily forested. Most of Maine's population is concentrated along its coast and in the flatter lands and river valleys reaching not too far inland. Around 80% of Maine's entire population lives in a relatively small section of the state, a corridor stretching from Kittery and the New Hampshire border, northeast to Bangor and the coastal town of Bar Harbor. The coastal region along the New Hampshire border is sometimes referred to as the Maine Beaches, and it pretty much encompasses York County. York County is the second most populous county in the state, but its population is fairly spread out, instead of centered in a single town, as it grows rapidly, with development spreading in from New Hampshire and Massachusetts. This is the most visited part of the state, bringing in nearly a quarter of all tourists who come to Maine, and is where many of the state's numerous vacation homes are located. It has, as its name suggests, the largest and some of the most popular beaches in the state. Places like Agunquit and Old Orchard Beach are major destinations. It's the most touristy part of the coast. Here you'll see boardwalks, amusement parks, piers, and beachfront condos, as opposed to the more remote fishing villages further along the coast. It has some high-profile visitors. The Bush family frequently vacations at their family compound in the wealthy beach town of Kennebunkport. While most of the main coast has seen its population grow, the main beaches along with the Portland area are by far the fastest growing parts of the state each seeing a near 10% increase in population since 2010. The growth, wealth, and heavy tourist presence is largely due to its location. Kittery is only about an hour and a half from Boston, making the main beaches the most easily accessible part of the state to the huge population centers of the Northeast. The Northeast Megalopolis, the strand of near-continuous urbanization stretching from Washington, D.C. to Boston, where 17% of the U.S. population lives, is sometimes considered to stretch as far northeast as Portland, and as this part of the state continues to grow and urbanize, it's likely that this will become less and less a matter of debate. The fastest growing part of the state, though, is Portland itself. Sitting on the western coast of Casco Bay, it's Maine's largest city and urban area, with around 205,000 people living in it and its suburbs. Though still a small city, it's by far the most populous and urbanized part of the state, an important port city and the 10th largest urban area in New England, and its suburbs continue to grow and expand. With Portland's urban area home to 15% of the state's entire population, it exercises major influence within the rest of the state. Other towns like Yarmouth sit on Casco Bay not far from the city. The mountainous, hilly, and rugged topography of the state and lack of a coastal plain has given Maine a coastline that appears jagged and sharp, with long bays and inlets cutting deep into the state, and thousands of rocky, forested islands dotting the coast. Maine is estimated to have well over 4,000 islands, many coastal, but many located in the state's numerous inland lakes. Only two other states in the country, 
Alaska, and Florida, both of which are significantly larger, have more islands than Maine. These islands, many of which are home to small towns and fishing villages, in large part began at Casco Bay and continue up the entirety of the state's coastline. From Casco Bay to Penobscot Bay is a region known as the Mid-Coast, home to towns like Brunswick on the Androscoggin River and Bath on the Kennebec not far away, as well as coastal towns on Penobscot Bay like Rockland, Camden, and Belfast. Beyond it, the easternmost part of the coast is known as the Down East and is even more sparsely populated. It's home to Mount Desert Island, the sixth largest island in the entire lower 48, and the location of Acadia National Park. The town of Bar Harbor, located on the island, is a major tourist destination, bringing around 4 million people each year, with Acadia the fifth most visited national park in the entire country. The island is also home to Jackson Labs, a major genetic research site. These coastal regions are home to a number of blueberry farming areas, port towns, and shipbuilding yards like the Bath Iron Works in Bath. Maine is one of the strongest maritime traditions in the country, and fishing has been an essential part of the state's history, economy, and culture. Fish and oysters are major exports, but the dominant product is of course lobsters. One of the most expensive seafood catches, lobster is Maine's largest export and the state is the largest lobster producer in the country. With the waters off of the northeastern US home to huge lobster populations, Maine brings in well over 100 million pounds of lobster each year. The lobster fishing is huge across the state's coast, it's especially dominant in the down east. While most of the coast is growing, the far northeast area around the Canadian border has seen its population decline over the last decade. Moving inland, the land climbs upward. It's still home to a population that, relative to the rest of the state, is fairly large. These were historic lumber and milling towns that grew along the rivers, such as Waterville on the Kennebec, Augusta, Maine's capital city, further downstream, and the state's second and third largest urban areas, respectively, home to 61,000 and 60,000 people in them and their suburbs, Bangor in the south central part of the state along the Penobscot River, and Lewiston in the southeast along the Androscoggin River. Further north, the landscape becomes mountainous and sparsely populated, not only difficult to inhabit, but much of it privately owned by paper and lumber companies, one of which, J.D. Irving, owns more than 5% of all the land in the state. The mountainous north of the state is filled with lakes, including the largest in the state, Moosehead Lake, as well as high peaks like Mount Katahdin, mountain cabins and vacation destinations, and ski resorts like Sugarloaf. This is truly a remote wilderness, the likes of which are difficult to find on the east coast, a beautiful landscape whose forests turn spectacular shades of red and orange in the fall, home to around 60,000 moose, six times more than any other state in the lower 48. After Vermont and New York, Maine is the third largest producer of maple syrup in the country, and much of it is from this part of the state. Finally, there's the enormous Aroostook County, the second largest county east of the Mississippi and larger than Rhode Island, Delaware, Connecticut, or Hawaii. It hugs the Canadian border and is often just called the county. While the western part is mostly sparsely populated forest, in the north and east, towns like Fort Kent, Madawaska, and Presque Isle hug the St. John River or sit not far from it. The valley of the St. John River is really the only major agricultural region in the state, famed for its potato production. It's the heart of America's Acadian population, a French-speaking ethnic group descended from an old French colony, which I'll talk more about later. The St. John Valley is a population center in New Brunswick too, and many towns sit right across the border from one another. Acadian flags fly throughout the region, and Aroostook County has the fourth largest population of French speakers in the entire country, with 22% of the county's population speaking the language, primarily the local dialects of New England and Boyan French. A number of towns are majority francophone. The border city of Madawaska is the most francophone town in the country, with 84% of the population speaking French. Nine of the 10 most French-speaking towns in the U.S. are all in Aroostook County. It's one of, in my opinion, the most fascinating cultural regions in the country. What is today Maine was originally home to a number of different indigenous peoples. The Pequawket lived in the south near where Biddeford and Portland are today. Further east, from the mid-coast north into the mountains, were the Nanrantsuak. From Penobscot Bay and Mount Desert Island north were the Penobscot. The Passamaquoddy lived throughout the down east, the Wallastawiak, and the Mi'kmaq people in the far north of Maine, and the Abenaki throughout most of the state. 
As European colonists arrived in North America, they brought with them diseases such as smallpox, which the native people of the continent had not been exposed to, and as such had little immunity. Disease decimated the continent's indigenous population, killing 90% of them, and those that survived often died at the hands of colonists, as Europeans expanded their settlement westward. It's unclear who the first Europeans to reach the region were. Greenland Vikings explored the North American coast, but the southernmost settlement found as of yet is in Newfoundland, thought to be the Vinland colony. A Norse coin from the era, known as the Main Penny, was found near Penobscot Bay, but it's unclear whether it made its way there from exploration, a lost settlement, or simply as a part of regional trade routes. Venetian explorer Juan Chaboto, known to the English whom he sailed for as John Cabot, explored the coast of Newfoundland and possibly made it to Maine, but regardless of whether or not he did, his voyage sparked interest in the rich fishing waters of the region, and fishing vessels from a number of European countries, particularly English, Basque, and Portuguese fishermen, began making the voyage to the region. Though it's uncertain whether any went as far as Maine, fishing villages were founded throughout Newfoundland and Canada's maritime provinces well before any formal colonial ventures reached this part of North America. The first documented European explorer to reach the region, though, was Italian explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano, who sailed for France and reached Maine in 1524. European colonization in the region, however, wouldn't fully begin until the 1600s, when it would become the site of some of the earliest French and English colonial ventures in what would become the United States. In 1604, a group of French colonists led by Samuel de Champlain and Pierre Dugois landed on a tiny island in Passamaquoddy Bay, on what is today the main side of the U.S.-Canada border. They named the island St. Croix and called their colony Acadia, but a harsh winter and scurvy outbreak killed many of the settlers, who fled just a year later across the Bay of Fundy to what is now Nova Scotia, founding a town called Port Royal, which would become the Acadian capital. At the same time, the English were becoming increasingly interested in establishing colonies in the North American mainland, something they'd attempted a few decades before with the failed Roanoke colony. The English referred to the entire coast between the French colony of Acadia and the Spanish colony of Florida as Virginia, and established two colonial companies, the Virginia Companies of London and Plymouth, respectively, to begin settling the coast. In 1607, each of the colonies brought settlers to the land they called Virginia, the London Company founded Jamestown near Chesapeake Bay, while the Plymouth Company went to what is now Maine, founding the Popham Colony slightly after Jamestown at the mouth of the Kennebec River. It was the third English settlement in what would become the United States, but the Popham Colony lasted only about a year before it ran out of food and the settlers deserted it, returning to England. With Popham no more, the name Virginia came to refer to not the entire eastern seaboard, but just the area around the remaining colony of Jamestown. In 1622, English King James I granted two noblemen, John Mason and Ferdinando Gorges, a charter to found a colony between the Merrimack and Kennebec rivers, which they called the Province of Maine. Seven years later, they split their colony in two on the Piscataqua River. Mason took the southern section, calling it New Hampshire, and Gorges the north, which he named New Somersetshire. Gorges later founded another colony within his lands called Ligonia, but both colonies were still collectively called the Province of Maine. English fishing villages later sprung up along the coast of the colonies, such as Kittery, Saco, Agamenicus, later York, which was the first town officially incorporated in what would become the U.S., and Casco, which would become Portland. To the south, though, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, centered on the port city of Boston, was growing populous and powerful, with a population 12 times the size of Maine. In 1652, they used a border dispute to claim control of lands far to the north, including the colonies of New Hampshire and Maine, and one, taking control of both. After two decades, New Hampshire would split off again, leaving the new province of Massachusetts Bay physically divided in two by New Hampshire's short coastline. A number of colonies were briefly unified into the unpopular Dominion of New England, but after its breakup a few years later, Maine remained a part of Massachusetts, and would be so for the next century and a half. They called it Yorkshire County, later shortened to York County, which is what the southernmost county of Maine is still called today. Acadia, which had been founded in Maine but moved across the Bay of Fundy, had grown in population, with French Acadian settlements spreading across what is today Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, and approaching York County. The region was on the periphery of French, British, and Native American control. 
and as English settlers expanded inland throughout New England, war broke out between English colonists and native people, known as King Philip's War. Considered the bloodiest war in American history, proportional to the population at the time, it eventually resulted in the British conquering more indigenous lands. After the war, the native people of the region became increasingly worried about British expansion, as well as the growing power of the Iroquois Confederacy to the west. Native tribes from Lake Champlain all the way to Newfoundland unified into a powerful union called the Wabanaki or Donland Confederacy, allying themselves with the French of Acadia. Separated from the French colony of Canada along the St. Lawrence River, the Acadians had developed their own distinct culture and national identity, but throughout the early 1700s, Britain launched a series of attacks on the colony, capturing the capital city of Port Royal. By the end of the French and Indian War between the two empires in 1763, Britain took control of all the French colonies east of the Mississippi, including Acadia, and their ally, the Wabanaki Confederacy, lost effective control of the region. Britain began a brutal and violent expulsion of the Acadians, in which thousands died and most were forced from the colony. Many left for Louisiana, a former French colony where they had linguistic ties and settled in the swamps and bayous west of New Orleans, forming a unique cultural identity, dialect of French, and style of cuisine influenced by the region, the name Acadian changing to Cajun. Only around a fifth of the Acadians successfully remained in hiding within Acadia from the British. Many who'd lived along the St. John River in what was now the colony of Nova Scotia, and later would be split off into New Brunswick, fled to the upper reaches of the region, founding towns in what is now the Acadian region of the north of Maine. Massachusetts began to send more settlers north to York County, offering free plots of land, and the region's population began to grow rapidly. When the Revolutionary War broke out, this northern part of Massachusetts was strongly in favor of independence. Close to British Canada, it was home to the Battle of Machias, the war's first naval battle. Britain occupied parts of the county, calling it the Colony of New Ireland, and burned down the town of Falmouth, sitting on Casco Bay. After the war's end, Falmouth would be rebuilt and renamed Portland. When the Revolutionary War ended, Massachusetts ratified the Constitution and joined the United States on February 6, 1788, becoming the sixth state to join the Union. But the Treaty of Paris, which ended the conflict, left the borders between Maine and British Canada unclear. Britain claimed lands deep into the northern and eastern parts of the region, while the United States claimed that Massachusetts extended far closer to the St. Lawrence River than Maine does today. It was difficult for Massachusetts to govern the physically separated former colony of Maine, and almost immediately locals began calling for it to become a separate state. To make governance easier, Massachusetts gave the region, which they named the District of Maine, a local government. The district grew rapidly, tripling in population from 1785 to 1800, as settlers, mostly of English descent, moved north from Massachusetts. By 1800, the district would be home to 150,000 people, and it would double within the next two decades alone. The district thrived as poor settlers moved in, buying up land in the near interior of the state. Lumber mills sprung up along rivers and industrial towns developed around them. Bangor became a major center of logging and in just a few decades became the largest lumber port in the world. Lumberjacks logged the district of Maine's rich forests and in Bangor and other interior river towns, sawmills processed the logs, shipping the wood from there downstream to the coast, from where it was shipped to ports across the country and the world. Coastal cities like Portland prospered and grew, trading goods from the interior with the rest of the U.S. as well as global markets in Europe and the Caribbean. But as its population grew, a divide was growing as well within the district. Coastal areas were dominated by trade, and a wealthy merchant class which had close economic ties to Boston. Sitting on the edge of the country, Maine was quite vulnerable. And in the colonial era, it had made sense to many to have the protection of the powerful colony of Massachusetts Bay. But the Wabanaki and French were no longer a threat, and as the interior of the district grew, poor farmers and loggers living on the frontier increasingly felt that Boston did not represent their interests. Massachusetts, and its politics and religion, was at the time dominated by a wealthy urban elite that the poor settlers of the woods and hills of the Maine frontier felt disconnected from. At the same time, the District of Maine was physically disconnected from the rest of Massachusetts, and now had a large enough population that a real case could be made for statehood. But on the coast, port towns had close economic ties with Boston, and typically supported remaining in the state. War between Britain and France caused rising tensions in North America. 
The U.S. was neutral and wanted to continue trading with both countries, but each wanted to stop American trade with their enemy. Britain blockaded American ships, even capturing crews of American sailors and forcing them into the British Navy, and eventually war broke out between the two countries, called the War of 1812. New England in particular was dependent on trade with Britain's colonies in Canada and the Caribbean, and the region's merchants opposed the war and the resulting ban on trade with Britain. Many New England merchants continued to illegally trade with Britain during the war, and the Massachusetts state government was seen to be backing them. When British troops invaded Maine, again trying to establish a colony of New Ireland, Massachusetts did little to protect it. Britain was eventually pushed out, but their failure to defend the district had made support for independence from Massachusetts much more popular in Maine. William King, a merchant and state senator, became a major leader of the movement for statehood. In 1819, after a number of successful referendums, the Massachusetts state government voted to allow Maine to split from Massachusetts. Approval from Congress, the final step for statehood, should have been simple, but it got wrapped up in the most controversial issue of the era, one that would eventually lead to civil war. As the country was expanding west, whether or not slavery would be expanded to newly added states became a major issue, as the addition of new states could shift the balance of power in the Senate one way or another, either for or against the horrible practice. Many pro-abolition northerners believed slavery should not be allowed to spread to new states, while many southerners believed new states should be permitted to allow it. Whether or not slavery was allowed to expand would likely tip the balance of power either for or against it in Congress, but neither faction had enough support to move the issue their way. It wasn't a problem in Maine. The abolitionist district didn't want to allow slavery within its borders should it gain statehood, but in Missouri, where there were a number of people living in slavery, it became an issue. Because both were applying for statehood at the same time, some proposed adding both together as a compromise, one free state and one slave state. Eventually, what was known as the Missouri Compromise passed, allowing Missouri to enter as a slave state and Maine as a free state, and banning the extension of slavery to anywhere in the country north of Missouri's southern border, save for Missouri itself, while allowing it south of the border. On March 15, 1820, Maine was admitted to the Union, becoming the 23rd state, with William King, a leader of the statehood movement, its first governor. But the circumstances of its victory in a decades-long push for statehood soured the wind in the pro-abolition state. If anything, the Missouri Compromise simply pushed the issue of slavery further down the road. In just a few decades, civil war would erupt. Maine remained with the Union during the war, and 73,000 Mainers enlisted in the Union Army, more proportionally to its population than any other state. The state was actually home to one small naval battle, the Battle of Portland Harbor, where Confederate naval ships attacked a few fishing ships in Portland Harbor. Not long after statehood, the capital was moved inland from Portland to Augusta, a small town on the Kennebec River. The long-standing border dispute with Britain over the northern part of the state, bloodless but tense, had been known as the Aroostook War. In 1842, the two countries settled it, drawing the border the U.S. and Canada currently have partway between their two claims. A number of important political figures from this era hailed from Maine, such as House Speaker James Blaine and Lincoln's first vice president, Hannibal Hamlin. Maine continued to grow fairly rapidly, especially as industry came to towns along waterfalls of the state's rivers. Bangor became known as the lumber capital of the world. Lewiston, a major textile producer with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution in New England, and Portland, an important port city. With the St. Lawrence River freezing in the winter, a railroad from Montreal to Portland allowed the city to become the most important port city for Canada for much of the year, which helped it grow significantly. Shipbuilding became a major industry in coastal cities like Bath, especially as the U.S. ramped up international trade. Rich forests provided abundant timber and raging rivers powered a thriving milling industry. Many people were farmers who grew just enough food to feed themselves and their families on small farms, and potato farming grew in the Acadian region of the St. John Valley. Quarrying was important, and as always, fishing was a dominant industry. At one point, a fifth of all fish produced in the U.S. came from Maine. As the state's industries grew, immigrants came in. Many Irish immigrants fleeing the Great Famine arrived in the state, joining an existing population mostly descended from English and Acadian colonists. A large number of immigrants, though, came from just to the north. With its Acadian history, Maine already had significant French heritage, and as it industrialized, provided promising jobs close by. 
While some of these immigrants were Acadians, most were Quebecois, French Canadians coming from the still French-speaking but culturally distinct region of Quebec. Instead of staying near the border like the Acadians, many went south to industrial cities to work in the textile, lumber, and paper mills. Lewiston, in particular, attracted a large number of French-Canadian immigrants. Maine's population growth slowed over time as the country expanded west. Mainers often packed up and tried their luck westward, flocking to states like Ohio and Minnesota. As gold rushes in a booming timber industry drove settlers to the west coast, a large number of Mainers left for California, Oregon, and Washington, as they were often already experienced in logging and could board ships leaving frequently from the state's ports. The state's industrial importance continued during the World Wars, when it became an important center of shipbuilding, and during World War I, a rail bridge at the border town of Vanceboro was bombed by German spies hoping to cut supply lines. Following the end of the war, though, the state went through several major economic changes. While paper milling and shipbuilding remained strong, industry in general declined, as textile mills in particular left for other parts of the country and the world. It became difficult for smaller farmers to compete with the newer, large-scale industrial farms of the western U.S., and many Mainers left rural parts of the state as agricultural jobs dried up. The state successfully focused on cleaning up its rivers, which had faced significant pollution from the mills that lined them. Several prominent politicians rose to power in Maine in this post-war era, such as Margaret Chase Smith, who became the first woman in American history to serve in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. One of Maine's most influential politicians, though, was Ed Muskie, who was elected governor in a surprising upset before serving two decades in the Senate, narrowly losing the vice presidency in 1968 as Hubert Humphrey's running mate and serving as Jimmy Carter's secretary of state. While industry declined, tourism grew. Maine had always been a major vacation destination, but once it became connected to the interstate highway system, roads like the Maine Turnpike made it significantly easier for vacationers from Massachusetts and other parts of the Northeast to visit the state or buy up second homes. Its rural landscape, beautiful scenery, and proximity to major cities made it an appealing destination, especially for people from the city hoping to find a rural escape who found the state's lifestyle attractive. Wealthy families from the Northeast, like the Rockefellers and Bushes, were just a few of the many who bought second homes in the state. At the same time, though, most of the state's full-time residents are working class, employed in industries like fishing and logging. In this sense, it's an outlier as well. The state faces real problems with poverty, and though it's roughly in the middle of the pack of the country as a whole, today it has by far the lowest median household income of any Northeastern state. You have to go as far south as North Carolina before you find a state on the Atlantic coast with a median income lower than Maine's. Maine's largest city and urban area by far is Portland, home to 205,000 people in it and its suburbs. With just 66,000 people in its city limits, only the largest cities of Wyoming, West Virginia, and Vermont are home to fewer people than Portland. It's a blend of old and new, a historic port city revolving around a harbor on Casco Bay home to older brick buildings and more modern high-rises. It's nestled on a peninsula in Casco Bay in southern Maine and is surrounded by water. The Four River, home to the port which the city centered on, sits to the south, and an almost fully enclosed bay called Back Cove lies to the north. It's a city of peninsulas, islands, forests, and hills. Its suburbs are hemmed in by woodlands, but the city is spread to cover several other points and peninsulas, as well as a number of islands in the bay such as Peaks Island and Great Diamond Island, which can only be accessed by boat. It's the smaller and older of the country's two Portlands, though it's often overshadowed by the much larger city of Portland, Oregon. Portland, Maine, named after an island off the coast of England, is older than its west coast cousin by over 200 years. As the story goes, two of the Oregon city's founders wanted to name it after their hometowns. One was from Boston and the other from Portland, and it got its name after the Mainer won a coin toss. The fastest growing part of Maine, Portland is a beautiful and historic city, with a strong maritime tradition, delicious seafood, and historic architecture. The state's capital, Augusta, is one of the country's smallest state capitals, home to just 18,000 people. Only the capital cities of Pierre, South Dakota, and Montpelier, Vermont have fewer residents. It's home to a small but scenic downtown along the Kennebec River and a beautiful capitol building set right against a forested hillside. In terms of race, Maine is the least diverse state in the country. 92% of Mainers are white, the largest proportion of any state in the country, around 3% are multiracial, 2% Latino, and 1% each are black and Asian American.
Most Mainers primarily trace their ancestry to either England, France, or Ireland. It's one of just three states where English Americans are reported to be the most common ancestry group, though the numbers of Americans with ancestors from England are thought to be very undercounted. If self-reported French and French-Canadian ancestry were combined, French Americans would make up the largest ancestry group in the state, with a fifth of Mainers tracing their ancestry to France, mostly from the state's Acadian population as well as later immigration from Quebec. The state has the highest proportion of French Americans in the country, even more so than Louisiana, and is home to the highest proportion of French speakers as well, with nearly 4% of the state speaking the language at home. The state has not been a major destination for immigrants in recent years, and though it's received some immigration from countries like Somalia and the Philippines, most immigrants to the state are from just across the border in Canada. Like much of New England, Maine is one of the least religious states in the country. Around a third of the population is not religious, and only 20% of Mainers attend church regularly, tied for the second lowest rate with New Hampshire, and surpassed by only Vermont. Most Mainers are Christian, the majority Protestant, in particular mainline Protestant, but it has a fairly large Catholic population as well. About a fifth of the state's residents are Catholic, in large part due to the state's significant French and Irish heritage. On top of that, it has one of the country's largest populations of residents who practice faiths other than Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, or any of the other major world religions, at about 5% of the population. According to the Pew Research Center, these are mostly members of the non-Trinitarian Unitarian Church, though many of them would likely consider themselves Christian, as well as followers of various New Age faiths. The state is home to many different unique foods. Unsurprisingly, it has some of the best seafood in the country, like oysters and clam chowder, but it's most famous for lobster, its largest export. Though it wasn't invented there, the lobster rolls become a main staple. Though something like donuts are thought to have originated centuries ago in Germany or the Netherlands, the classic American ring-shaped donut came out of Maine. A 16-year-old ship crewman named Hanson Gregory claims to have punched a hole in a donut for the first time while on board a ship and spread his method from there to local bakers. Whoopie pies are a classic Maine dessert, and Moxie is a regional soda that's very popular within the state. They have their own variety of baked beans which are cooked in a pit in the ground called bean hole beans. Mainers speak with a very unique accent and dialect of English. It's similar to other New England accents, but can get pretty strong and distinct, especially the further you go into the Down East. Writers like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and E.B. White, the author of Charlotte's Web, were from Maine, as is Stephen King, who sets many of his books in the state. The state has no major league sports teams, and its residents tend to root for Boston-based teams. Its largest newspaper is the Portland Press Herald, and its busiest airports are the Portland International Jetport and the Bangor International Airport. Major colleges include the University of New England, with campuses in Biddeford and Portland, the University of Maine, which sits in the town of Orono on an island in the Penobscot River outside of Bangor, the University of Southern Maine, with three campuses across the region, and Southern Maine Community College in South Portland. It's also home to a number of smaller or well-known liberal arts colleges like Bowdoin in Brunswick, Bates in Lewiston, and Colby in Waterville. Major companies headquartered in Maine include the Baker Company, New England supermarket chain Hannaford, and L.L. Bean. It's the only state in the entire Northeast that's home to a national park. Acadia National Park is a beautiful park located mostly on Mount Desert Island, as well as a number of nearby islands and peninsulas, and it is home to Cadillac Mountain, the tallest mountain on the Atlantic coast of the U.S. National parks are few and far between in the eastern U.S., and with many major cities a weekend trip away, Acadia draws millions of visitors to the state. It's the fifth most visited out of the country's 63 national parks, bringing in nearly 4 million people a year. Some famous Mainers include Stephen King, Milton Bradley, Anna Kendrick, Patrick Dempsey, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. No presidents have as of yet come from Maine, though it has been home to several influential political figures throughout history. Hannibal Hamlin had represented the state in the House and Senate and served as governor before he became Abraham Lincoln's vice president, though he was replaced on the ballot for re-election after one term. Speaker of the House James Blaine later represented the state in the Senate, served twice as Secretary of State, and became the Republican nominee for president, though he lost to Grover Cleveland. And Ed Muskie was governor, senator, secretary of state, and the Democratic nominee for vice president in 1968, losing to Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. 
On top of that, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, who led an influential faction of liberal so-called Rockefeller Republicans throughout the mid-20th century, serving as Gerald Ford's vice president, based his political career out of New York, but was born in Bar Harbor, where his family vacationed. Another wealthy and influential political family, the Bush family, which produced two presidents, built their political careers out of Connecticut and Texas, but spent significant time at Walker's Point, a family estate in Kenny Bunkport, which served as a summer White House of sorts during George H.W. Bush's presidency. Maine is politically one of the most moderate states in the country and is a strong independent streak. Its politics are arguably some of the most unique in the U.S. Its Cook Partisan Voting Index, or PVI, is D plus 2, meaning that in a given year, the state outperforms the Democratic nominee by only 2% on average. For reference, the classic swing state of Pennsylvania has the same lean towards the Republican Party. The state voted for Republicans by large margins until 1992, when it became a safe blue state. It was one of just two states where third-party candidate Ross Perot came in second place, and Green Party candidate Ralph Nader broke 5% of the vote in 2000, as did Libertarian Gary Johnson in 2016. Since 2016, the state has become much more competitive. Maine was the first ever state to implement ranked choice voting, and along with Nebraska, is one of just two states that splits their electoral college votes by congressional district. Maine currently has four electoral votes. It gives two to the winner of the state overall, and one each to the winner of each respective district. Because of this, it split its electoral votes in both 2016 and 2020, with Clinton and Biden winning three votes each and Trump one vote, due to his wins in the state's second congressional district. It's one of just seven states whose two senators are not part of the same political party, and one of just three represented by an independent senator. One of its senators, Angus King, is an independent who caucuses with the Democrats, and the other, Susan Collins, is a Republican. Both are considered among the most ideologically moderate members of the Senate. Both of Maine's representatives in the House of Representatives are Democrats, as is his governor, Janet Mills. As this series goes deeper into the geography and history of the United States, I hope to provide more insight into economic changes that have occurred across the country, in states like Maine and others. Economic concepts around finance and statistics can seem difficult to grasp, but there's a fun and easy way to learn more about them. Today's sponsor, Brilliant, is the best way to learn data science, math, and computer science in a fun and interactive way. Brilliant has thousands of courses available, and adds new ones every month. It doesn't matter if you have lots of experience or are just getting started. Brilliant will customize their content to fit your needs, and let you work at whatever pace works best for you. Data skills are only becoming more in demand, which is why I love their Data Analysis Fundamentals course. With just a few quick lessons, you get to analyze real data and draw interesting conclusions from it. This kind of analysis is a huge part of geography, and is a strategy I use frequently when I'm making videos for that is interesting. The best part is, my viewers get the first 30 days of Brilliant for free, and the first 200 get 20% off an annual plan. Just visit brilliant.org slash that is interesting. That's brilliant.org slash that is interesting for 30 days of Brilliant for free and 20% off. That is it for Maine. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's already joined my Patreon. Through it you can access different things such as quarterly channel newsletters, thumbnail previews, early access to maps I create, an exclusive Discord Q&A with me, and shoutouts in my videos such as these. Starting in a few months, I'll be going on a filming tour for the series of the rest of the country that I haven't covered yet, so stay posted, I'll be releasing more info about that in the coming months. Also, please subscribe to my brother's channel, Quinn the Cameraman. He made this great intro at the beginning of this video that I use in all of the US Explained videos, so go show him some support and check out the podcast we co-host, Riffing and Ranting. We bring on some cool guests, some of whom you're probably familiar with. I tried to be pretty thorough with this video, but I know there were definitely things I missed as there was a lot to talk about. I want to give a big thank you to everyone from Maine who helped give me information for this video, leaving detailed and informative comments on YouTube as well as Discord. I truly would not have been able to make this video without all your help. My next video in this series will be on Missouri. I've never been there, so if you're from Missouri, please respond in my community post or my comment here, and let me know what you'd like to see included about your home state. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.